Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have Joao Manuel de Silva Santos with us today. Hello, Joao. Hello, good morning. Good morning. It is morning. It is my 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. on September 22nd of uh, 2023 as we record this. Uh, Joao, where, uh, where are you located at? I'm in beautiful Boulder, Colorado. It's very sunny today. Uh, awesome. I love, the, I love the clocks above your head there. It looks like you got DC, Colorado, and then Hawaii going on. So all good things. Good. Uh, so has it started, have the leaves started to change colors uh, in Colorado yet? Yes, somewhat, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Getting there. Fall. fall is coming. Fall is coming. <laughs> and it is, I'm in Phoenix, uh, and we are, in fact, cooling off, too. Um, so we were dipping below the, the triple digit Fahrenheit, um, and it's becoming quite pleasant in the morning, 60, 70. It's quite nice. Very cool. And Joao, what's your, what's your position there in Colorado? Uh, I'm a postdoc researcher. Uh, I've been cool. here for uh, almost exactly two years now. Nice. Very nice. Uh, first trip to the States? Uh, no, I've been, I've been here before uh, oh, okay. many, many, many times. Uh, okay. First time I was here in the U.S. as a, as a graduate student uh, five or six years ago. Nice. All right. Where'd you do your Where'd you do your grad grad work at? Um, I uh, I was a graduate student in Stockholm, Sweden, um, and um, as part of my studies, I, I also observed the Swedish Solar Telescope in the yeah. Canary Islands. Cool. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, and Joao, what do you like to do for research? Uh, so my my research focuses on um, studying. Uh, solar chromosphere this is one of the layers of the sun uh, sort of intermediate layers of the solar atmosphere between the photosphere and the corona mm -hmm. uh, and my research is all about trying to understand uh, all the interesting uh, dynamics and, and uh, phenomena that, that we see in, uh, in this very high resolution and a very high temporal cadence uh, images uh, of the sun very nice that is going to bring us to this very awesome APJ letter. Happened there. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. My bad. Uh, it is open access, people. It's the open access era. You can go get a copy for free. Go get one. Magnetic fields in solar plage regions. Insights from high sensitivity, high sensitivity spectropolarimetry. And Joao, take us away. Right, so thank you so much once again for this opportunity to, to showcase our work. Uh, this paper resulted from uh, um, a team effort here at the uh, National Solar Observatory, uh, which uh, operates the new Daniel K in a way solar telescope. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the island of Maui, Maui in Hawaii. Um, and it's, it's now officially the largest uh, dedicated solar observatory uh, operating uh, at the moment. Yes. And here we are essentially uh, reporting uh, on some of the, the results of the very first data um, acquired in summer of uh, last year. Oh, very good. During, okay. during what we call the operations commissioning phase. Okay. Uh, so but many of the systems are still being tested and developed. Um, so this is still very early days for, for DCAST, um, but it is expected to, to stay uh, in operation for a few decades. So this is oh, exciting. Very nice. Um, First results. Many of, many of my co-authors have been involved in this process uh, to some extent from the very data acquisition at the summit, mm -hmm. data analysis. Cool. Very nice. Early science results. Here we go. Right. Okay. So, um, when we talk about um, ground-based high-resolution solar observations, we typically refer to very small field of views of targets on the on the solar um, disk or off limb, but not like the whole sun as a star, right? So uh, in this paper, uh, what we're studying are these uh, plage regions. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll jump right into uh, figure one so that uh, people sure. can see uh, Absolutely. Figure what one. plage figure regions look like. And we'll do a global here and we'll zoom in as need be. Okay, figure one, overview of June 3rd. Okay. All right. So plus regions are uh, these very extended uh, bright patches that you see on a solar surface. So on the, in the top figure, um, I'm showing you um, what we call a context image. It's actually not provided by DICIST, but by NASA's 
uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory no, it's okay. away from, from space. So this is a, a, a UV continuum image. Um, and what you see is the um, upper photosphere. So, um, <laughs> and uh, you see the flashes appear, appear bright um, relative to, to, to the background. Got uh, it. The, the middle panel is an actual um, dickest image obtained by the VBI, which is the uh, broadband imager. Mm -hmm. This is a G band image, so it's a, it's a molecular uh, band um, in the visible. And here you actually, actually see slightly deeper into the atmosphere at the, the base of the photosphere. Mm -hmm. You can actually see the individual granules. Um, yeah. And the plage also shows up at this very uh, uh, fine, little brightness. Um, yeah. Very cool. Plage regions typically appear uh, around active regions and near sunspots. Uh, uh, and they stay uh, sometimes much longer after they have disappeared, uh, which is which is the case here. So you, what you say what you see here is a decaying plage re, plage region that has been stripped of all the <laughs> sunspots and pores. Um, there's actually a little one there. Um, yeah. Otherwise, it's it's essentially dying off, and it will it, it eventually disappear after a few weeks. So, or, Okay, uh, one question, and then what are the uh, red and orange boxes? The right, top? so the um, the orange and red boxes are the, the field of view of um, uh, the VISP uh, data, which VISP is, ah. is split spectrograph that is essentially scanning mm -hmm. this, this region from uh, left to right. Okay. Um, and the different channels have slightly different fields of view, so um, one okay. of the channels has a, has a larger field of view that's the orange one uh, and the other one has these two uh, slimmer uh, bands right okay cool thank you i am with you now in the bottom panel uh you see another uh, broadband imager by the vbi and this is actually an, an hydrogen h beta uh, uh, line okay uh, image uh, and this line actually um, um, forms slightly higher in the atmosphere in the in the chromosphere and here you see that the scenery is totally different. You actually see this very uh, fine elongated features that we call fibrils. Yes. Um, and they they originate in the plage foot points. These are the magnetic foot points. Okay. Uh, they're anchored in the photosphere. And then this field sort of expands with height and kind of bends and forms what we call a, a magnetic canopy, sort of like a tree canopy uh, above all these granules. Nice. And so we, we believe these are essentially like um, um, the smoking gun of uh, like magnetic field lines that are bending uh, like over the, the the center of these uh, super granular structures. Very nice, cool, very good, awesome figures. And, uh, if I, had, I I'm not showing here in this paper, but uh, if I if I uh, had plotted here uh, also a figure um, at UV wavelengths in the in the corona, uh, so in extreme UV. You would also see that plage are also the foot points of these uh, very hot uh, tall coronal loops. Okay. And so we, we think plage are very important to also understand um, this interplay between magnetic fields and, and the coronal uh, emissions and the coronal heating. Uh, so you can think of them as sort of the interface through which uh, this energy that comes from the solar interior eventually uh, bursts through, through the surface and propagates into higher layers of the, of the atmosphere. Got it. Okay. Very good. Cool. I'm with you. Um, right. So obviously the, one of the, or perhaps the most important thing about uh, plages and actually any other target on the solar uh, atmosphere is, um, is actually uh, uh, first and foremost, understanding and, and, and measuring the magnetic fields because uh, we believe that they, they essentially dominate Pretty much all the dynamics that we that we observe, um, and this has been has been done for a very long time uh, since the seventies. Mm -hmm. so able to do it uh, in the photosphere, we can measure these magnetic fields uh, uh, in the photosphere of the sun, uh, where the field is stronger and the spectral lines produce very strong um, polarization signals uh, by the, the Zeeman effect. Right, uh, but the situation is very different in higher layers in the chromosphere and the corona. And this is because magnetic field uh, expands and weakens with height uh, so that the field is weaker and the spectral lines are also not very sensitive uh, uh, anymore to the magnetic field. So they produce mm -hmm. very weak uh, polarization signals. Uh, and so this is, this is bad. 
because that means we, we are blind to, to, to these fields, to the magnetic fields, and the higher layers of the atmosphere, where they actually totally dominate uh, mm. the, the, the plasma motions. Yeah. So the, 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 the plasma is dominated by magnetic field uh, in the chromosphere and above. <laughs> cool. So how do, how do we uh, fix this? Uh, how do we uh, move forward in this field without uh, knowing the magnetic field? Well, you, we can't, and that's why <laughs> we have to build larger telescopes, uh, and that's how Vickist uh, 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 comes about. Um, Got it. People, especially people from other fields uh, of astronomy, always find very surprising that we need to build a four-meter telescope to observe the sun, uh, because we get so much um, um, light, of course. Um, yeah, and, and, but... And the thing we need to think about is that the sun is actually a resolved uh, star, right? We're not trying to observe the sun as a whole, Right. We're trying to observe very tiny details on the surface. So there is actually not, a, not that much light that comes from a, the very tiny resolution element of your detector. Good. Uh, so we, we need a, a very high signal to noise just, a, just as much as any other. Yeah. Absolutely. And the situation becomes even more difficult when you're trying to measure polarization uh, because polarization signals are 100 to 1,000 times weaker than intensity signals ooh, ooh. Uh, in the photosphere. <laughs> and if you go to the corona, they can be ten thousand times weaker, and this is really a, it's really a challenge, um, and it is really impossible, uh, and it, it it was impossible until now to uh, to really uh, measure these fields uh, with a decent uh, spatial resolution, so or, and temporal resolution. So you typically need to uh, integrate for longer, uh, as you do for stellar sources, or um, by uh, summing in space, and that means you you lose the spatial resolution as well. Yeah. And that is also a problem for solar physics because the sun uh, is not static, but it moves, uh, evolves very fast. Uh, we can actually see uh, when you're observing the telescope, you can see it evolving uh, in real time. Yeah. But we cannot afford to integrate uh, for a very long time. Otherwise, our pictures get uh, blurred. Yeah. It's so messy. It's the bigger telescope. Um, Got it. And at the same time, um, every time you go to a, to, a, um, to a larger telescope, we use data from the larger telescopes, you only see that there are more and more details at diffraction limit of the telescope. So there's more and more um, uh, structures given at even smaller at, um, spatial scales. Mm -hmm. So this becomes really a challenge to be able to um, obtain uh, data that is um, with extremely high signal to noise ratio. That's what we call high sensitivity in this paper, okay. uh, but also high spatial resolution and high temporal resolution. So that, that is uh, the real um, uh, technological okay. challenge, I guess. Yeah, uh, and these are the whole, the, the three main aspects that Dickist is trying to uh, to to address. Okay, cool. I think some of that was covered. These disappear in the data. Okay. Right. Cool. So this this data was was taken during uh, um, the uh, operations commission phase, as I said. Mm -hmm. um, Level one. And uh, the interesting thing about this data set was that is it was acquired during. Uh, um, in coordination with the Parker Solar Probe um, during a, a recent um, flyby. So the, the Parker Solar Probe team determined um, that the specific target on the, on the solar surface was essentially the uh, the source region of the magnetic field that they can measure uh, you know, uh, from above from Parker uh, with Parker Solar Probe. Okay. Uh, and so this was an attempt at trying to um, uh, study the same region from two vantage points, uh, essentially. Very good. However, in this paper, we're not really uh, using the Parker uh, data. We're really just looking at the at the surface. But uh, the, the data is there, and uh, now I suppose the next step would be for the, for to connect to the, their team and, uh, and do that part of the work. We'll come back to that. Okay, very good. Um, so uh, the KIST uh, has an array of as a set of instruments uh, uh, that observe at different wavelengths, and they have different characteristics. In this case, uh, only two of them were operating, and that is VBI, which is a broadband imager. It takes uh, high-resolution images of, of the solar uh, atmosphere in different uh, filters. So these are broadband filters. Um, in this case, there was G-band, calcium, uh, calcium 2K, and the hydrogen beta uh, filters. Cool. Uh, and this composed like a very extended mosaic um, that is uh, over 200 arc seconds across. Oh wow! Okay. Um, and, oh, so, yeah. and this means that it takes you know it takes time to do this. So uh, uh, download. 
in this particular uh, for this particular um, um, in this particular observing mode, uh, the team decided to go for uh, a large field of view instead of going for an extremely high cadence, uh, you know, very small target. Um, so th this means that we have a large field of view, but it's essentially no uh, temporal information, right? Okay. Because um, it takes um, it takes a while to 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 observe a this, this large field of view. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, by a while, I mean uh, about an hour and a half. Ooh. Okay. So that means you can't really investigate the dynamics because the, the sun has evolved in the meantime. So, but at least you can study the. Um, the overall morphology of the region and uh, yeah snapshot right a snapshot mm -hmm. um and then we also observe with visp visp is a is a, is a slit uh, spectrograph the, um, so the way a spectrograph uh, uh, works if you want to uh, image a, a large field of view that you you do you build a raster map you start uh, from one point and then you build a, a yeah. sequence um and in this case, we observe uh, uh, with two arms uh, in two different spectral regions. One of them focuses on, focuses on the um, some iron lines, so 6301, 6302 angstroms. These are lines that uh, uh, form in the photosphere. And, and the other arm observes the, the calcium 2, 8552 line. And this is a line that it's formed in the chromosphere. Mm -hmm. And so, and this is important for us to, to understand this uh, uh, connection between different layers. So, where? Right. We, you would always want to observe uh, different um, uh, spectral lines that probe different layers of the sun, so you can do this sort of tomography. Uh, yeah, 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 very cool, very cool. Yeah. Um, and then there's some of the details of the of, of this data, the spectral resolution, um, and the uh, pixel scales and all that. Uh, so the the, the type, the kind of the pixel scale, the spatial scales we're we're looking for here are. Um, uh, on the order of a few tens of kilometers, so this is extremely oh, special wow. resolution. Wow. Of course, it's at the moment it's uh, seeing limited, so we, we don't actually uh, effectively observe it at such low spatial scales. Um, yeah. But that is essentially the goal of DKIS, um, aided by adaptive optics. Step at a time. Um, cool. Right, and that's how the data looks like. Very nice. And then we move into some. So the, the main goal of, of this paper was essentially to um, to study the, the magnetic field, of course, uh, in plage regions, uh, okay. in, this, in this very extended plage region, and, and understand the dynamics. And this is why uh, spectra and, and images are, are useful, because uh, we can measure things like the velocities and magnetic fields uh, and, and all that. Nice. Uh, and uh, to, to obtain those, we, uh, we uh, uh, run what we call uh, uh, inversions. This is a slang we use in solar physics, and it refers to just uh, inference or data feeding. Uh, uh, so we're trying to in go from the data to, to model parameters, and we call this an inversion. Okay. Yes. Yes. So this is this is essentially uh, uh, the, what I do is we feed a model to, to the spectra, uh, okay. the intensity and polarization signals, and then we obtain uh, velocities and magnetic fields and all that. Um, and that's what we did uh, in this in this case. Okay. Uh, I'm with uh, you. The caveat is that uh, because this is a very large field of view, um, we had to to um, um, do some uh, approximations for protractability because we, we cannot afford to do this rate of transfer for the whole field of view. Yeah, uh, right. it's a very expensive problem. Yes, uh, and so we, uh, we used two very common approximations uh, that enable us to to obtain this this magnetic field maps uh, in a very fast way. Uh, okay. This is, of course, this can also be improved in future. Okay, let's see, stratification, okay. And uh, before I get to the actual magnetic, to the magnetic fields, I would actually uh, want to look just at the, at the data. Uh, yeah. They are, um, and that is the, this figure that shows the uh, intensity image uh, in the calcium line uh, at the top. And the lower panels in, in the blue and yellow color map show um, uh, polarization maps, essentially. Okay. So the bottom figure shows the TCP, that's total circular polarization, and the total linear polarization, TLP. So essentially what we're doing here are, is mm -hmm. we're summing uh, the, the signals in, uh, in wavelength. We are integrating the, the whole uh, passband, okay. uh, uh, adding up all the, the polarization signals. 
Uh, so what you see in the photosphere, it's it's similar to the previous images that I showed you in UV. You see this this white uh, this uh, you know, yellow patches mm -hmm. where the polarization signals are strong, and this is where the magnetic field is more concentrated okay. in the flash. Okay. Linear. So one of the things you see, um, I'm talking about final D and E uh, right now because it's mm -hmm. lower down and then you move up. Mm -hmm. All good. Uh, the circular polarization is typically stronger than the linear polarization. Uh, that's easier to measure. Yes. And, and this refers to uh, the component of the magnetic field that is aligned uh, along the line of sight. Uh, whereas the linear polarization measures the, is related to the uh, horizontal component of the field. Okay. So it is always easier to measure uh, the component of the field along the line of sight than the, than the transverse field, which is parallel uh, to the surface. Mm -hmm. So what you see here is, is really just how the, the field is concentrated in the photosphere and this uh, in the plage. Now, if you go to the higher layers um, in the in the uh, panels above, uh, mm -hmm. this is the chromosphere, and this is a totally different picture. So you still see in PCP uh, in panel B uh, yep. this, these yellow patches, and that's the plage. Mm -hmm. so away from the plage, you also see uh, these polarization signals from the from the fibrils. Um, Ooh, this this uh, little uh, loops that I showed you previously uh, in the VBI images. Uh huh. Um, and they are also very clear in the linear polarization uh, in panel yeah. C. And uh, this may appear slightly noisy to you if you've never seen <laughs> uh, polarization image images of the sun, uh, but this this is actually a significant improvement uh, relative to uh, with respect to previous observations. So right. you actually see, for example, in this location uh, indicated by the arrow, mm -hmm. you see very uh, uh, clear elongated features. Um, yes. And they line up with the, with the intensity features that you see in panel A. Uh, so you have these dark fibrils, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in flash and extending um, cool. several arc seconds. Uh, and, and those are, um, uh, they, they also show, clearly show uh, uh, polarization yep. print uh, in the polarization maps. So this, this is this really shows uh, that they have a magnetic origin. Um, yeah. Uh huh. So Beautiful. whereas in the plage itself, um, uh, you see that uh, there, there's no signal basically, so it's a dark blue. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially means that the uh, the the, um, the magnetic fields in plage are mostly uh, uh, radial, so they are mostly um, along the line of sight. They're pointing towards us. Okay. Uh, and then as as the fibrils kind of bend. So to the side, then the, the field becomes more horizontal, and that's why we, we see this uh, stronger uh, uh, signals in the in fibrils. Nice, very cool. Yeah, what does the DC mean? Oh, DC means it's the direction of the of the disk center, because uh, this, this ah. target is is slightly uh, offset uh, from from disk center, and this means that this just means that we are looking at the target from the slanted view. Uh, yes. Okay, I'm with you. Good. Beautiful. This is just and the. Of course, we we had we had tried to uh, obtain these polarization maps before, um, and uh, there was basically no structure. It was it was always very noisy. Okay. But we we knew uh, we were expecting to to observe this based on simulations, for example. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. Should we slide down to figure three? So this figure is uh, showcasing the uh, um, the high uh, spectral resolution of, of the disk spectrograph. Uh, and this is significant because most solar data obtained thus far have been uh, with very low spectral resolution. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And in this case, uh, we have quite a quite a wide uh, spectral range. We can observe multiple lines at the same time, and with very high uh, spectral resolution as well. Mm -hmm. and that this enables us to to see these very complicated uh, line shapes, uh, both in intensity and also in polarization. Mm -hmm. In yes. this case, we're focusing on the on the edge of a plage region uh, in panels A and B. Yes. Uh, and here we're just trying to compare all the different. Uh, uh, spectral lines look like at different locations. And yeah. in panel B, I show you the uh, a map of the Doppler signals. So the, uh, it's essentially a map of the uh, yeah. velocity along the line of sight in these regions. Okay, I am 
And the uh, important thing of this figure is really uh, those locations where you have these uh, uh, very strong uh, red patches where the velocities go above 10 kilometers per second. Mm -hmm. And these type of velocities are supersonic in the in the chromosphere, uh, where the speed of sound is around 7 kilometers per second. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. So we believe these are locations that are um, that show very very significant uh, uh, dynamics. Um, why uh, this this we we see these strong flows? We're not sure, uh, but uh, we see that they correlate also with locations where in the intensity image you see uh, those bright brightenings. For example, to location two, this yellow. Yeah. Mass, uh huh. This very strong brightening, and that is right at the foot point where you see this this very strong down flows. Great. Okay. What what we think they are is. Um, a, um, essentially flows that are uh, draining down from the fibrils. Uh, so they, they essentially are falling back down to, to, the, to the solar surface. Yep. Uh, and when they, they, they hit the chromosphere, uh, they, they lead to shocks. And, and this uh, hits the, the atmosphere and, of course, yep. leads to enhanced emission. And that's why we, we, we think we see this, this uh, enhanced emission and, uh, and the stronger downflows. Nice. That's great resolution. Very nice. Okay, so that's where we're at. And then... So this is, panel C shows just uh, uh, some example spectra at uh, those locations, and you can clearly see how... how oh, here we go. One, how two. much the calcium line changes, for example. So it's, the calcium line is typically an absorption line, like the profile number three, uh, everywhere on the surface and in the quiet zone. But at the, those locations where we see those very strong flows, the line just goes crazy. And you have all these emission components and uh, with multiple peaks yeah yeah number two here's got two peaks yeah oh, it does this one okay wild mm -hmm. uh, now measuring polarization signals is still quite challenging and that's in panel d i show you uh, that that's the stokes u component mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in all of those spectra there's basically no signal except the, the last one it's got a little something here a little, uh, little signal there yeah, and where was four? Four was off. This is at the very edge of the plot. That, that, this yeah, is exactly yeah. where the field uh, right. starts to bend. Uh, so this leads to a right. stronger comp or, uh, transverse component along the line of sight, and that's why you get perhaps a uh, uh, stronger signal. Yeah. So this is mm -hmm. still, uh, still uh, a bit challenging, uh, and we have to certainly devise better strategies in the future to uh, uh, include this the signal-to-noise ratio. Okay. Uh, but in Stokes V, however, in panel E, uh, signals are there they're, they're quite strong um, quite strong okay, very good and they look also pretty wild <laughs> in some cases purely in two and four and just to remind two is right on it right on the right spot right okay yeah very nice cool uh, how about this feature over at 8536 that's a large one this is a uh, right. This is these are uh, lines formed in the photosphere. So this, the, in this case, we're seeing the, the signals emerging from the from the lower down in the photosphere. Ah, okay. And that's where they. That's why they're 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 typically stronger. So the, the field is stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. there are also locations. For example, in the in the, in the case of uh, profile number two, so in yellow. Yes. Uh, the signal in the chromosphere is actually stronger than than in the in the photosphere. Uh, yeah. Wild. Yeah. Look at the amplitude there. Mm -hmm. Difference. And this is probably just really related to the topology of the field. It's probably a location where um, uh, the field has sort of an hourglass shape, and you're looking from a from a, a perspective where the field is actually stronger in the chromosphere than in the photosphere. Yeah, the pipe. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very cool. Well, I can see why some temporal resolution here in the future ones will be very useful. <laughs> right. Cool. It's very interesting to see how these profiles change in, in a very high temporal cadence. Right, right. What is what is the? Let me ask that then. What is the expected temporal cadence uh, once you get rolling? Uh, you can go as fast as, as like a few seconds. Uh, if you go, for example, a C times ten mode, where you keep the split, the, the spectrograph split at a fixed location. Okay. For example, if you don't care about having a very large field of view, you just uh, want to maximize temporal cadence. You can just keep the, the slit uh, fixed, and uh, it can go as fast as a, uh, a second or two, I suppose. Nice. Okay, cool. Thank you. I know that was off topic a little bit, but okay. <laughs> okay. And then we got figure three discussions. And we got one more in the main body of this figure, which is the B fields. 
Right, and this is this is the main the main goal of the paper was mm -hmm. going from the spectra to the measurements of magnetic field. So in panel A, uh, I show you um, a map. This is also provided by NASA's uh, STO uh, spacecraft. Okay. This is a map of magnetic field along the line of sight. This is lower resolution um, than what is provided by by uh, Dickist, and you can see that if you compare it to uh, the image in panel B, where there's clearly a lot more a lot more structure. And uh, if I, if I if I saturate the image images even further, then the uh, differences become even more significant. Yeah. The VASP. Okay. And in panel C, it's essentially uh, okay. Also, a map of the magnetic field, but higher up in the chromosphere. So you see that morphologically, uh, uh, it looks uh, quite different. Uh, they correlate spatially, of course, but the map in the chromosphere is more diffuse. It's it's a bit more. Uh, expanded because what you yeah. see here is the field really going from this very tiny concentrations in the photosphere and really opening up in, in the chromosphere yeah um, what is uh what is f1 and f2 here in c and f1 and f2 are two slices that i, I took to uh, uh essentially uh, compute the, the some statistics of the field along those lines, along those lines. Okay. If, you, if you really uh, zoom in into these regions you can actually see these uh, striations in the in the magnetic field maps um, it's it's hard to see here, but I promise. It's a little hard to see. There. <laughs> I, there's something there, <laughs> but okay, I'll, I'll trust you. I'll trust you. <laughs> very um, good. And and basically, as we're seeing here, there are these very small variations of the field along these fibrils. So you have this mm -hmm. uh, fibril structures, and uh, if we take this cross section along these fibrils, you can actually see that the field is oscillating a little bit. Do we have the the precision is such that you can actually. Uh, Measure the field along individual fibrils. Uh, Ooh, wow! This was this was not possible to do before. That is very nice. Very. Yeah, cool. This is very important, really, to understand how they operate. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Uh, panel D is just a, a scatter plot comparing uh, the two magnetograms, the one provided by STO and the one provided by by VISP. Okay. It's not perhaps very interesting to uh, explain now, and the panels on the right. Also show magnetograms, but this time the transverse component of the field. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. And uh, here I'll 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 just uh, um, bring your attention again to panel F. This is again in the chromosphere, mm -hmm. and, and there you, you you can you can see a bit more clearly those elongated features. For example, the one indicated by the yellow arrow. Yeah. Uh, so sort of a long elongated feature there. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, the uh, the plage itself. Uh, appears as these dark patches, with these yes. black patches. Yes. Uh, that's actually where the plasma is located in the photosphere, and that's where the field, uh, the transverse field is weak. So again, this means that the field is, is mostly vertical at those locations. Okay. Uh, it expands uh, away from the plasma. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, in terms of the, the actual field the measurements that, that we that we obtained, they are slightly lower than previous estimates. They are on the order of. of 200 to 300 Gauss. These are very small, uh, very weak fields uh, yeah. compared to other astronomical targets. Uh, like, uh, <laughs> but um, and I think this is probably selection effect because I believe previous observations, because they had limited sensitivity, they naturally had to observe stronger targets where the fields are, are higher. Yes. And here, I think we're just uh, observing ah. a, a weaker plage, and that's why you're observing weaker fields. And this was not possible to, to do before. So I think this is really just a sort of a selection effect. Right, right. Yeah, awesome. Very cool. Um, now, panel, panel G was a sort of a, a very hopeful attempt at measuring the variation of the field as a function of uh, mu. Oh. Mu is essentially the cosine of the cosine. Yeah, yeah. angle. So it measures the distance from the center of the sun towards the limb. Um, okay. And yep. so if the magnetic fields expand with height, you would expect that if you observe progressively towards the limb, the, the field uh, strength would decay because when you observe towards the limb of the sun, you're actually observing uh, higher layers of the atmosphere yes. due to projection effect. Yes. Um, and so if the field weakens with height, then if you observe towards the limb, we should see the field also decreasing uh, towards the limb. Fair enough. And we sort of see that. <laughs> Uh, the solid lines of the yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we have a very significant outlier here in the middle of the, of the plot. Uh, we do, and uh, this is really just 
because not, not all plasma are the same and clearly at that location ah. there is a very strong concentration of the uh, okay. fields and this appears to ruin the, the figure. Um, sure. Sure. To really do this properly we would need a much larger uh, field of view and a yeah. larger data sample. Yeah. Um, but I just thought it was it was curious to, to check whether we see that effect. On the yeah, data. and I'm darkening, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Very nice. And how about H and I? Uh, H and I chose just the total, the total component of the field. So we're, we're uh, uh, ah. summing in quadrature the transverse and the and the and the, and the line of sight component. Okay. And just displaying how they look like. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Very cool. Very nice. Lots of work. Okay. Now we well, this, this magnetic field measurements are, are important because uh, um, we believe, of course, that the, the magnetic field uh, in particular dominates. Uh, it's, it's, it's behind the, it's a reason why we see this enhanced emissions in plush regions, uh, all the way from the, the uh, infrared to, to the ultraviolet. Okay. And so, in order to, to understand uh, uh, chromospheric heating and eventually coronal heating, we need to uh, measure the magnetic field. Um, and so, in the, in the next section, what I tried to do was to uh, uh, see how the intensity in the, in the calcium images correlates with, uh, with the field uh, strength, uh, see yes. if there is any, any sort of correlation. Um, because you can clearly see by eye that the patches where the field is stronger is also where you have enhanced emission. So there is some spatial association. Yes. But, uh, unfortunately, it's not that simple because when you build a scatter plot and you, you compute a, just a simple linear correlation coefficient, the correlation is, is very weak. Mm. And this, this just means that uh, the relation appears to be very uh, nonlinear. Um, and so we need to more sophisticated methods to uh, investigate this, this relation. Um, and uh, simulations show that um, the reason why this correlation may, may be weak is that um, uh, plage uh, seem to be uh, heated by uh, uh, electric currents. And these electric currents, they are located primarily at the edges of, of these magnetic flux tubes. So if, if you have like a magnetic flux tube here, and yeah. it's sort of expanding, the currents are actually slightly offset from the magnetic foot points. So yeah. the emission would be actually uh, um, not exactly located on top of the of the magnetic uh, element. And so we don't ex expect a one-to-one -one, uh, correlation between the, the field strength and the, and the intensity. So we have to appreciate that the, the solar atmosphere is, is a three-dimensional structure, right? Mm -hmm. and yes. There is cool. so an integration line along the line of sight of your emission. So it's, it's actually very hard to, to really uh, right. uh, interpret the emission uh, or to understand where, the, where this emission comes from in the atmosphere. Uh, we, we don't actually know. We don't, we don't know. Uh, in heights exactly where this emission comes from. Um, yeah. So it's, it's always very difficult to analyze just two different images. Uh, we need the whole 3D picture. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so we hope that this, this magnetic field measurements can also help us uh, uh, better constrain uh, simulations. Uh, uh, because simulations so far have been, um, have not been able to exactly reproduce many of the observables um, yeah. that, that, the, uh, the, uh, um, that we observe. <laughs> um, and so this is the first step towards uh, improving also uh, simulations of the solar atmosphere. Very cool, very nice. And there's two awesome appendices in this paper on some of the details of the data reduction. Uh, right. well, there, there was quite a lot of work involved in this, in this paper in terms of improving the data reduction. This is, okay. as I said in the very beginning, this is still the early days of the decreased operations. So there's a lot of a lot that we don't know about uh, uh, the calibrations uh, that need to be done uh, uh, before we actually do uh, the scientific cool. analysis. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my time was actually devoted to improve the, in particular, the polarization calibration and uh, what you call the crosstalk, uh, yep. to remove the crosstalk uh, from from the data, uh, so that you can finally uh, go into the interpretation. Uh, but now. Uh, the, the, the silver lining of all this work is that eventually uh, many of these uh, calibration routines that we have developed are going to be incorporated into the official pipeline. So future DKS data will have improved um, uh, wow. data, data, data reduction. Cool. 
So many of these issues that we have encountered in this very early data will no longer be there. Nice. Very good. And this, this appendix is essentially just detailing all those steps. Well, congratulations on doing all that work. That's very important. <laughs> it's grunt, but it must be done. <laughs> it must be done, yes. <laughs> be done. <laughs> very, very cool. This is an awesome APJ letter. Joao, I want to thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely APJ letter. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, and uh, dare I ask, <laughs> because this was basically calibration uh, opening calibration data. Uh, but where do, where do you think we go with this over the next two to five years? Clearly, there's going to be more DKIS data coming down. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about uh, uh, improving the three-dimensional models that people run of the sun, uh, things along those lines. So so where do you think we go over the next two to five years on DKIST? That is, that is actually a lot to look forward to. Um, mm -hmm. so as I said, in this paper, you're only using data from a few instruments, but DKIST will actually add uh, other instruments that will be operating um, simultaneously. One, one of them is uh, the LNIRS. This is a, uh, it's a very different uh, concept of an instrument in solar physics. It's actually a small integral field unit uh, where you can observe, uh, you can observe a very small uh, patch of the atmosphere, uh, but at least we have some sort of a, a spatial coherence. So we can observe a small patch at the same time uh, in, a, in a wide- Oh, space. oh, oh, very cool. This is quite new in solar physics. Uh, yeah. And it's also it's actually already operating. We just haven't seen any data yet, um, but it's it's there. And then there is another spectropolarimeter that is going to be installed um, uh, perhaps next year. Okay. Uh, and so this just adds. It's gonna. It's, it's really going to add to the uh, wealth of the spectral information that we can obtain uh, with DKIST. Yeah. That are other observing modes that people can explore. So in this case, we went for a very large field of view so that it can you can have uh, sort of a general picture of a, of a the magnetic makeup of a plage region. Uh, but instead, we could just focus on a very small field of view and going high temporal cadence and really observe all these interesting dynamics in, in real time. And nice. could, uh, this, is a, this is important for investigating uh, waves, for example. Yes. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, wave phenomena in the atmosphere, and these are believed to also play a role uh, in the atmospheric heating. Uh, and so you need very high cadence to, to observe them uh, because they have cadences of a few seconds to a few minutes. Seconds, yeah. um, okay. So there's, there's a lot to do, of course, <laughs> in terms of plage region. You can, you can investigate uh, plage regions at different locations on the sun and try to investigate uh, how the field expands with heights uh, by observing you know, the relation of the magnetic field as a function of the distance to the, to the limb. Um, you can do comparisons with the simulation. So there's, there's definitely a lot of work. And this is all now enabled uh, thanks to Vickers, uh high spatial and temporal resolution uh, and high sensitivity. This is actually the most crucial point that we can have uh, uh, significantly better sensitivity to really probe these very weak fields in the higher layers of the atmosphere. Nice. Nice. And of course, all enabled by your lovely Appendix A and Appendix B works. Right. <laughs> Congratulations on that. <laughs> very cool. Joao, thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely article. And that will do. Thank you. And I hope this made your astronomy day, your solar astronomy day, just a little bit better, everyone. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.